chapter 6, verse 24, and also Luke chapter 6, verse 38, those two verses form a little bit of the theology of what Jesus wanted to teach us about giving, and that's the title of the message this morning is Give. So uh, in honor of the gospel, uh, let me ask you to stand with me as we hear the gospel. Luke chapter 6, verse 38, and Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Jesus says, Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over, and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. In Matthew's Gospel, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This sermon about give. I was tempted to, to preach a sermon about total life discipleship this morning and deftly weave into it the message some uh, precepts and principles about money. That would have been my comfort zone. I don't like preaching about money. I have heard enough criticism of preachers who preach about money over the years 
to be sensitive to that and to realize that a lot of people, it's not their comfort zone to hear a sermon on money. Well, I want you to know that I repented of thinking about I would preach my comfort zone because God never called me or any other preacher, frankly, to preach in a comfort zone. Some do, and I have to admit that sometimes I want to. But he never called me to preach in a comfort zone or to provide a comfort zone for the church family. God's word has also convinced me that although we human beings say, my this, my that, when whatever we possess is really not ours at all, it's all his. The Lord is the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills, amen? Amen. But he is also the owner of those hills and the air that's over those hills. Amen. Amen. So whether we think we possess something or not, it really belongs to him. Uh, stewardship extends to every area of life. It's time, health, family, whatever you care to name. But this morning I'm specifically talking about money. This is going to be a biblical message in the tradition of Jesus. Because Jesus said more about a person's possessions and what he does with them than he ever said about heaven or hell or love or the second coming. Matter of fact, Jesus said this much about the second coming. He said that much about the money we have in our pockets. So this sermon is about money and specifically the money in your pocket. And my meaning this morning is very clear. We may say my money, we say my house, my real estate, my family, my time, my, 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 oh my, but it is not our money. It's not our time. It's not our stuff. It is his. Now, the discipline of stewardship is the discovery that God has entrusted to each of us and trusted us enough to place money and other resources in our pockets. And a person, a person that sees his responsibilities and his or her privileges as God's steward or God's manager, God's caretaker over what he possesses is the one who has believed what the preacher said when he stood before the congregation one morning. And he said to the congregation, friends, I got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is this that this church has all the money it needs to run the programs and pay the missionaries and keep the poor cared for. The congregation said what? Amen. He said the bad news is that money is still in your pockets. <laughs> well, this is also a straightforward message because these are urgent times. There's a lot to be done in a crisis time such as that in which we live. I could attempt to make us all feel good by pointing to what we have done in the past to give to missions and uh, keep the church afloat and keep God's house in repair. I could try to make us feel guilty that we aren't building new buildings like some other churches are doing. But feel good sermons or guilt trips is not what the word of God calls for. Feel good messages are like putting a band-aid on a cancerous tumor. If the doctor tells you that things are going well and that you should go home and you'll do just fine when in reality you only have a couple of weeks to live, that is not a doctor, that is the enemy. And it is the same thing with a preacher who feels that he has to coat the word of God with candy coating. When you take all of the facade and the fluff off of a feel good message or a guilt trip, what you have underneath that veneer is truth. And that's what we want to get at this morning because God calls us to talk truth, but he also calls us to live in truth. Now, a guilt trip preacher might get you to part with a couple of dollars, but you don't get near the heart of God with guilt giving. If the only thing that causes you to run to the offering plate is guilt, you're giving out of the wrong motive. And frankly, if we give out of guilt, it only takes a little time until that guilt does what? It subsides. We find a reason to mitigate against that guilt. We find uh, all the reasons why that guilt is ill-founded. And what do we do? We blame that on the preacher, don't we? And we almost become resistant to any kind of giving because it's the preacher's fault that I feel so guilty. 
Once the guilt of motion wears off, we rediscover our real heart's desire, which is to please self, not God. Guilt doesn't last. What does last is what the Word of God says. You remember, it, it even says it in the Scripture that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God lasts forever and ever and ever. Why is that? Because it's truth. It's all truth, and it's nothing but the truth. So this morning, what I want to share with you are the basics of Christian stewardship from the owner's manual, God's Word. Now, uh, that's the outline, incidentally, that's on this sheet that's out there, and uh, it has the scriptures that will back up what I'm going to be saying this morning. So, let's talk about the basics of Christian <coughs> stewardship. When you start with the basics, you start with the definition, and that's the first word that we're uh, investigating this morning. Question is, what is Christian stewardship? The answer is really simple. It comes from Malachi chapter 3. The answer is the whole tithe. Malachi the prophet says, bring all the tithes. Did he say bring some of the tithe? Oh. Did he say bring 5% of the tithe? Did he say bring 95% of the tithe? No, he said bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That's the definition. Uh, three qualifiers about that. You say, Russell, what exactly is a tithe? Well, mathematically, a tithe is 10%. That's what tithe in the old English means, tenth, one-tenth. It's 10% of your income. The first time we encounter that word is in the book of Genesis, chapter 14, verse 20, where Abraham paid a tithe or a tenth to a priest named Melchizedek. I don't have time to go into everything surrounding that incident, but just let it be said this way, Abraham understood that to worship properly, he had to give something away. He had to give something of himself. What he gave was 10% of the spoils that he had reclaimed in uh, trying to protect his family. Let's leave it at that. So mathematically, a tithe, a Christian's responsibility is 10%. Now, positionally, is the second word that's qualified here. It's not just a tenth, it's the first tenth. Uh, when most of us are introduced to the idea of giving a tithe, how many of you were introduced to that by your parents? Your parents taught you to tithe when you were little, perhaps. Uh, that was the way it was in Brown Boy's household. And generally speaking, although when somebody is a child and they learn that very early, it's a lot easier to accept because children are malleable, they're, they're flexible, they understand that they don't know everything and they're like little sponges soaking it up. But some, some of us came to Christ later in life or maybe we never taught it or never picked up on it, but when we're introduced as an adult, generally what happens is we mentally picture all the other financial commitments we already have and then we try to mentally fit tithing into that program. Folks, that is not what God has told us to do. All the way through Scripture, we encounter the principle of first fruits. God's people are not to bring leftovers to worship. Abel, uh, Abel's brother Cain had that problem. He imagined that his choice of what to bring was just as good as what God had said to bring. And he was wrong and it got him in big trouble. It got him so angry over what God had said and what God rejected as his offering that he killed his brother over it. God requires first fruits. In other words, he requires the best you have. In Malachi's day, the problem was that people were bringing sick and disfigured animals for their sacrifice. They would pick the worst of the flock to bring because they figured, well, I won't need that one. You know, that's just a run to the litter. I'll bring that one for my offering. And they would give it to God as a sacrifice. No, the first tenth, the tithe, is not only the first that you get, it's to be the best that you have. And then the third word is definitely. The tithe is definitely the Lord's. It is holy. It says that in, Deuter in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, one-tenth of the produce of the land whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord. Does it say should be given to the Lord or does it belong to the Lord? Did your parents ever teach you don't touch what doesn't belong to you? 
That is the meaning of this sentence right here. It belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. When God says, touch not, he really means it. He said it once in the Old Testament where he said, touch not my prophets, nor uh, touch not mine anointed, nor do my prophets any harm. When God says something is holy and must be set apart, he means don't touch it. It's kind of like the definition of why God created poison ivy. Little boy said it's because there's some cotton picking things you keep your hands off of, you know. <laughs> we may be tempted to say, Russell, that's Old Testament law and we are under grace. And you know what? You're absolutely right. But Jesus also rather firmly said and clearly that he came to fulfill that law, not to do away with it. The early church took that seriously. You can see that in the book of Acts, the book of Philippians. First century believers not only gave a tithe, that was the baseline. They knew 10%, that first tenth of their earnings was holy, it was the tithe to be given to the Lord, but they went past that. They gave gifts and offerings above the tithe. Read all about that in the book of Acts. Read the whole book. I won't tell you where it is. It'll be good for you. Read the whole 28 chapters of Acts. Okay? And you'll find it in there, but you'll find it several places in there. And you read the book of Philippians, which is only a few chapters, and you'll find out that they did the same thing. Giving was not bowing just to the law of Old Testament tithing. Giving was a sacrificial completing of the law. You may have been listening closely while I was praying. You may not have been, so I'll repeat it. I said, Lord, some of us gave out of our abundance today. We had it to spare. Some of us brought it here uh, because it was a sacrifice and we recognized that it would be a blessing in God's eyes. You may also say tithing is biblical, but Russell, I just can't afford that much right now. I want you to know I have heard those words many times in 40 years of ministry. And truth be told, I said those words myself early on in my walk with Jesus. I tithed when I was a little child and my parents would give me 50 cents for a weekly allowance. I knew where that first nickel went. I knew it was to go into the offering plate. And I did, but I got away from church. I think you remember my testimony. I've shared it enough times with you. I was a prodigal. I wandered in the far country. I was in the pig pen for a long time. And I want you to know that most prodigals do not tithe. Hello. I mean, that's from personal experience. Most prodigals do not tithe. Uh, it's the good son that stays home that tithes, and he sometimes grumbles over it. But <laughs> the point that I'm trying to bring out here is that I said those words because when I came back to Christ, uh, when Elizabeth and I were, were still young parents of young children, when, when I came back to Christ at that stage in my life, and I was introduced, I was confronted with the idea of tithing, I said to myself, whoa, there's the mortgage, there's MasterCard, there's this, there's the oil bill, there's this, there's that, the other. How in the world am I going to take 10? I, you know, I just didn't know. Truth be told, as I said, I said those words, I don't know that I could do that. We made a leap of faith and we did that. We've been doing it ever since. And I have no regrets about that. Um, but it usually means when you hear those words, I don't know if I can fit that in. I don't know if I can actually give that much. That usually means that the person has obligated his or her income to the point where we're so over our head in bills, so much so that the concept of tithing brings fear. You fear that the charge cards won't get paid. Folks, that is an indication and here's the discomfort part of the comfort zone. That's an indication that your comfort in the way you have arranged your financial life is more important to you than obedience to God. That's what that means. When you worry over tithing, you are, you are putting MasterCard ahead of who God is. For a follower of Jesus Christ, that is a dangerous game to play. Now, I'm not a guilt preacher. I'm just telling the truth this morning. Common sense says that you must pay your bills, otherwise you're going to get hauled into court. I mean, that's, that's the excuse. That's the one I gave. That's probably the one that's in your mind if, if that's the way you think. 
Common sense says you pay your bills, otherwise you get hauled into court. Spiritual sense overrules that objection. Because given a choice, given a choice, I would rather be hauled into any court in the land, be publicly humiliated, have all my worldly possessions taken away, and be put in prison for life without parole, than to stand one second before Almighty God and His court, having withheld what is holy to the Lord. If it belongs to him, it doesn't belong to me. And I have no business holding on to it. So the first basic of Christian stewardship is definition. The first tenth is holy to the Lord. It does not belong to us or to MasterCard or Visa. It belongs to God. Second <clears throat> basic of Christian stewardship is destination. Where do I give my tithes? And this is really basic for some of you this morning. I'm sure most of you. But God also gave us the answer through the prophet, Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, bring the tithe, whole tithe, into where? The storehouse. What is the storehouse? The storehouse is the church, but more accurately, it is your church. This, if you're a member of Mount Zion United Methodist Church, if you are a member uh, or uh, you worship here regularly, and this is the place you've chosen to worship, and serve God, then this is your church and this is where you pay your tithes. Somebody once called the paint, I, I have kind of a split personality. I worship at two different places. I worship here and I worship Pleasant Hill. It's simple for me. What I am paid here, I tithe here. What I'm paid at Pleasant Hill, I tithe over at Pleasant Hill. You want to increase my tithe, increase my salary. <laughs> How'd you like that? You know, I didn't even plan to say that. <laughs> the storehouse. Somebody once called the paying of our tithes an act of worship at God's house of worship. And I like that. The place where you've chosen to worship is the place you're to worship with your time. Whichever, whenever God's word is specific, such as thou shalt not steal, it means you don't steal. You know, and there's, there's no question about it. You don't take what isn't yours. Don't kill, meaning don't murder. You don't murder people. Don't lust after this. Don't covet after that. You know, wherever God's word is specific like that, you just be obediently quiet. You don't have to answer that. You just do it. And there's no question that the Bible tells us to bring our tithe where we worship. My personal belief that when and what you give above the tithe, that is entirely discretionary. I believe you give those gifts where the Spirit impresses you the greatest need exists. I'll give you an example of that. I always keep uh, uh, an extra bill in my wallet. I won't tell you how large it is, but I always keep an extra bill in my wallet because there are times, and it doesn't happen every week, doesn't happen every month, doesn't even happen every quarter. But I would say there's not three months that goes by that I'm not impressed in some way, sometime during the week with somebody I meet, that I need to give that person that bill that I've been holding for them. Because that is something over my time. It's something completely that I, and I don't ask for a tax receipt for it, I just give it. Why? Because that's the spirit working in my life. And it gives me such joy to be able to meet somebody else's need. Wait for the Spirit to say, yes, do that. But the first fruit, tithe, belongs where you worship. Sometimes I'm asked for counsel by folks on the internet. One year, uh, many years ago, there was a church family you know, in the church that I served that had moved to another state, and they considered me still their pastor, and uh, they were looking for another church home, so they didn't have a regular place of worship just yet. They were going here, they were going there, they were trying to find where God wanted them to be. And so they asked me, he sent me an email, and they said, Pastor, what do we do with our tithe in this time when we really don't have a church home? And she, she said, should, should we send it to you? Boy, what a temptation, you know, lead me not into temptation, Lord, right? Um, what I told her to do was give it to whatever church they were worshiping at that week. Why? Because if they were going to truly worship, you can't worship without giving of yourself. You give of yourself when you promise the Lord that you'll 
obey, <laughs> that you'll you'll love him, that you'll try to love other people. Isn't that giving of yourself? Sure it is. And if you're willing to put you in the offering plate, what makes us think that we shouldn't put our money in the offering plate? The ongoing mission and work of the church, God's people who make up that church, that church body, are to bring faithfully their tithes to worship each week. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says that. On the first day of the week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you've earned. Don't wait. Don't wait. So definition, the first 10%, and it's your best 10%. Destination, God's house, your church. And then the third uh, Christian basic stewardship is disbursement. Where does my tithe go? What does it do? It meets the needs that God chooses. Notice that it meets spiritual needs. It tells us in Deuteronomy 14, 22, that we set aside a tithe of what we've earned. For a farmer, it's his crops. For, um, for an accountant, it's perhaps money. For a teacher, it's uh, uh, that paycheck. Um, this applies, it says later in that verse, to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil. In other words, everything that comes into your life. And uh, one of the chief needs that we all have is to learn worship. There was a man uh, who came to his pastor with a check for $10,000. He said, Pastor, this is my tithe for the next two years. I want to pay it up in advance. You know, that pastor was a very wise man. He said, I'm not going to take it. You bring it as God gives it to you. And you say, wait a minute. I mean, I can see a church treasurer scratching his head over that, Danny, amen? Uh, you know, check for $10,000, why wouldn't we accept that? The point is simply this. If that's over and above your tithe, that's one thing. Wonderful, bring it on. But if it's your tithe and you're doing it because you want to make sure that all those Sundays you're going to miss, uh, you have already paid your tithes, you miss the entire essence of working, uh, of worship rather. You miss the entire essence of what God really demands. Giving is connected and so connected to our regular need of worship. You would not pray one good long prayer at the beginning of a year and say, okay, God, see you same time next year, right? You wouldn't eat one good meal at the beginning of a month and then just fast until the first of the next month, would you? It's the same way with worship. Your spiritual needs and incidentally your physical needs are met in ways you cannot describe when you bring your offering regularly. On the first day of the week, you bring yourself and you bring your offering. Besides spiritual needs, our giving also meets temporal needs. Deuteronomy 14, 28, and 29 also says that. God's people should never have to beg or go hungry. And that's God's promise. But listen, that promise of God is based on the fact that God expects his church, his family, his believers in the local church to act with fidelity, to bring their tithes regularly for meat in the storehouse. The church cannot give away what the members have not put in the box. It's as simple as that. The formula for revival has always been humble prayer mixed with earnest obedience, tithes included. When God's praying people are God's obedient and giving people, the world sees the demonstration of God's love and God's power and needs are met, miracles begin to happen, society is deeply affected. We got those three basics and I don't have time to finish off this message, but let me just give you an overview of the last few things I wanted to say here. Number four, on Christian stewardship basic is don't delay. What if I reject this? What if I say, no, 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 no. I know it's written in the Bible there, but you know what? My circumstances, you don't understand. What if I reject this whole concept of tithing? Well, it's simple. You're robbing God. God says that without stuttering in the Malachi passage. Malachi 3, verse 8 and 10. God is talking through the prophet Malachi and it says, Malachi is just parroting, he's, he's acting like God, he's saying, he's talking like he's God at this moment. And so God is speaking, and he's saying, should people rob or cheat God? Yet you cheated me. And it's a conversation, the people answer back, but you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? And God says, you have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. Now listen, when the mortgage company sends you the bill that says your mortgage payment is due, 
or your car payment is due, or this is due, or that is due. What does that mean? It means you have a responsibility, right? When God says, bring all the times into the storehouse, that is our responsibility. It's also a joy. I mean, it's very plain language, and even though it's disturbing information, it's a fact that demands very plain details. There are a lot of people listed on a lot of roles of many churches, and unfortunately, they not only neglect to worship on a regular basis with their presence, they choose to spend God's tithes on themselves. That is not obedient, it is not very wise, it's not smart at all, because it's self-destructive. When you court God's displeasure, you court an awful lot of trouble in your life. Now listen, I'm not a guilt trip preacher, but I'm reporting the news this morning. If God's people were to tithe, do you realize how dangerous it could be to the heart of your church treasurer? Do you realize how badly he would be shocked to see an offering at Mount Zion United Methodist Church of 10% of all the money that was earned this past week? Now, am I saying Mount Zion, you people don't talk? No, I'm not, I'm not chiding anybody. I'm giving the facts. The fact is, the church in America Believers, people who belong to churches, people who are professing Christians, people who say they believe the Bible, and people who try to obey what Scripture says, you know what the average percentage of giving is? Less than 2%. That means there's 8% of what is holy to the Lord that is never given. It's extremely harmful to your spiritual and your physical health to put aside your need for worship and giving. Um, the widow, when Jesus was sitting there at the treasury, the widow walked in and she threw in her two mice. What did Jesus say about that? He said, this widow, this poor widow, gave more than anybody else. The rich were there, the not so rich were there, and the poor were there. And we have all of that in every church in America. Okay? Why did Jesus say that? Well, if you were to calculate the worth of two mites, it's about one sixty-fourth of a day's wages. Translate that into if you're working for ten dollars an hour, that's about a dollar and a quarter, less than the price of a pretty good cheeseburger. That's what the woman gave. Why did Jesus say that was so much? Because it was all she had. If that was all she had, and people live day to day, sometimes <clears throat> half a day to half a day, in those days, what was that woman thinking? She was thinking, I am here with an open heart. I'm trusting in God. And she was also there giving those last two coins, those last dollar and a quarter that she had. She was going to worship with her heart and with her purse even if she didn't eat that day. Now that hits a Methodist heart, doesn't it? I mean, we, we love to eat. We all do love to eat. There's no question about that. I mean, the evidence is in, folks. We love to eat. She gave out of her need, which was sacrificial. So, the, the last, the last thing I wanted to say, and it's, my time's already gone here, the last thing that I wanted to say today is Christian stewardship basic number five is that we must make a decision. We have to make a decision about what we're going to do. I shared with you earlier in the message today that um, Elizabeth and I started tithing, it was actually in in 1977. So that's been a few years that we've been uh, we've been trying to follow God's direction. And uh, we graduated from tithing to a little bit above the tithe here and there. And sometimes we only tithe, sometimes we get a lot greater. Um, every time I preach a message like this, 
you know what, my checkbook gets a little bit thinner because I've become more convicted that I haven't grown recently. So I'm going to grow a little bit more today. And I'm encouraging you to do the same thing. Make a decision that you'll honor God with His tithe. And if He moves in your heart, you're offering. See, the two are not the same. We take up the offering, but the tithe is holy. It belongs to the Lord. There's no question about that one. Let's pray together. Father God, for all the things that we want to do in our life and the money that it takes to get there, Lord, sometimes our plans make us robbers. Sometimes what we want to do make us thieves in your sight. We have to make a decision to change our mind, but more than that, to change our ways. Lord, help us to be the kind of givers that are good, faithful servants. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Christian people rejoice. God has given, and when it was his turn to give, he didn't send some broken down, used up, never needed again angel. He sent his best. He sent his only begotten son for us. Amen. Your tithe, your best, back to him. Amen. Go in peace, go in grace. This church, Pastor Russell Brownworth, our pastor, considering the size of our congregation in numbers, I think it's uh, it's uh, incredible. I'm always amazed at the amount of outpouring of food given during our CUOC food drive. I know we live in a seem like a divided and indifferent world, but this is just proof to me there's a lot of compassion and the love of Jesus Christ in a lot of hearts and minds. <laughs>